Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given us to come to worship, Lord, to spend time as a body of believers united in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that comes um, because of his death and resurrection, Lord, and, and uh, that we can be confident that those who trust in his saving work will be saved. Lord, we praise you for that. We ask now your blessing upon our time this morning. We pray for those who are apart from us, asking your hand to be upon them, and your hand to be upon Michael this morning as he comes to share your word. We praise you for the work that you are doing in the Lupin's ministry, and ask that uh, you would embolden Michael as he comes to share the good news, as his sermon title says this morning. We thank you for him. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, we welcome each one of you here to our Mission Sunday as we come to worship the Lord, specifically focusing on what he is doing both here through the missions work in Oxford, in our country, but also throughout the entire world. We praise the Lord for those things. And as we join together for a time of worship unto the Lord together, I want to begin with a passage of Scripture for our call to worship, and I'd invite you to stand with me for that call to worship as we look to rejoice in the Lord this morning. One that would be quite fitting, I thought, for us today is from James chapter 1, reading verses 19 through 27. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Blessed be the word of the Lord. We come now to a time of singing together, asking that you would turn with me in your black hymnals this morning for a song that we've sung the past few weeks, a theme song for our Mission Sunday, a reminder for us of the compassion of the Lord, hymn number 163, the Compassion Hymn.
Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue in our singing this morning in the Black Hymnal. You can turn to hymn number 348 with me as we were reminded of the, the task of missions work of spreading the good news of the gospel to those who so desperately need to hear it. Let's sing together hymn number 348, Facing a Task. Amen. What a powerful reminder for us on this Missions Sunday. You know, it was interesting. I was talking to someone this past week, and it's a reminder for us of why missions exists. The question for us, one day we will all stand before the throne of God, and we will be asked to give a reason 
why we should enter in. When we're asked, if we appeal to anything other than the finished work of Christ, we'll have no part with the Father. But if our faith rests firmly in Jesus Christ, knowing that it is not because of any good that we've done, that even though maybe we've done good things all of our lives, those things still will not account for the weight of our sin, yet Christ fully covers it. And so we praise God for that, that there is no name under heaven by which men can be saved except for that of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We rejoice in that this morning. I'm going to read the passage of Scripture here. If you'd turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, Michael is going to be bringing the message this morning. I was informed before the message this past week that Michael Well, this week, he's going to take it easy and probably not bring the fire and brimstone. But yet, we are excited for the message that God has laid upon his heart. I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God this morning, and then I'll have a word of prayer for Michael and ask him to come and bring the message. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. It says, For while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Praise be to God for that reconciliation. Blessed be the word of the Lord. I'd invite you now to bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time this morning. We come rejoicing in the reconciliation that we've received through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray now that as we come to this time hearing your word proclaimed, that your hand would be upon Michael as he comes to bring the message. Lord, as I prayed with him before the service, Lord, I ask that you would cause for his words to fall away, but for yours to stand. Lord, that our hearts might be changed by the truth of your word, that you'd give Michael confidence, boldness, clarity of mind as he comes now to proclaim your truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Michael. Good morning. So I... uh I think I messed up on the slides, Rich. If you can advance me to the next slide just once, and then I should be good from then on. You might have to click it versus errors. (laughs) Maybe I really messed it up. Oh, Rich, just click to the next slide. The screens are fun. That should do it. And I should be able to click it now. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, most of you have heard Kristen and I mentioned Lupins. In fact, Kristen talked about it this morning in Sunday school. But maybe you haven't heard enough to really understand what or who Lupins is. The Missions Committee has asked us to present to you our church family the ministry of Lupins to help you better understand our mission. Like I said, in Sunday school, Kristen talked about the organization, where it's located, who we serve, and what we do. This morning, while I'll try to keep do a little bit of the same, I'm going to keep it more Uh, G-rated. 
Ultimately, I want to point you back to the gospel, which is the reason we do what we do. I do want to mention, Kristen does have a table set up. Is it in the back of the fellowship hall? Back here. That has um, a newsletter, sign-up sheet, prayer cards for some of our orphan girls, and a sheet showing some of our immediate needs. I don't want to spend too much time on the history of Lupin's, but I think it's important to understand a little background to see how God works. Kristen and I have had a connection in Uganda um, for quite a few years. Through that connection, I've been traveling there since 2017 uh, to set up an ultimate Frisbee tournament um, for local for churches organized through our friend Richmond. Because of this, I was able to meet his sister Doreen, and as Kristen said, Richmond invited her to stay with us for a while uh, a few years back, and that's how Kristen and her got to meet. Uh, Doreen's been fighting against human trafficking for quite a few years. In 2021, she decided to start an organization, Lupins, to fight for young girls who are victims of the most vile form of slavery. Sorry, I'm not going to make it through this. Uh, hopefully, you guys aren't as bad as I am. <laughs> I'm going to need my tissues. In 2022, Doreen and her brother called Kristen to talk about Lupins and the help they needed. I'm not sure how it happened, and I'm not quite sure Kristen knows either, but by the end of the call, it was decided that Kristen was going to start the uh, organization in the U.S. Uh, to, to do fundraising to help support Lupins. <laughs> Kristen had no idea how to do this, uh, but she still managed to file all the paperwork to uh, start the corporation and to get the, uh, apply for the 501c3, which she ended up getting in six months. I don't know if anyone's done that, but that's, uh, that's pretty incredible to do it in that short amount of time. Uh, Kristen's been stretched more than I've seen her stretch before, and she's done pretty amazing things. As we stared on our website, that's hard to read, sorry. Lupins exists to combat the ongoing problems of abuse and exploitation in Uganda and restore victims of child trafficking. Our method is to work to rescue and restore young ladies who have been victims of this abuse and transform their lives through the love of Christ. This bit's extremely important to us. While there is great need to free these young ladies from the slavery they are in, there is worse slavery from which only the saving power of Jesus Christ can rescue any of us. Um, it's important to note, and this isn't, this isn't a note of braggery on our part, but just um, to help you understand the incomprehensible evil that exists in this world and why organizations like Lupins must exist. We're the only organization in Uganda that rescues girls under nine. <laughs> Sorry. We've rescued girls as young as three, and while John's not in here, I'm going to say this, and he can fight me later, but that's not fair. This shouldn't happen, and frankly, Lupins shouldn't have to exist. However, we see this as our mission to help correct this injustice. We've divided our mission into four phases, and I think these phases are fitting because it also helps, it also speaks of our story with Christ. I want you to look at these phases through the lens of your walk with Christ, and perhaps it can help you better understand your own salvation from slavery. Uh, we're going to go to Romans uh, 5, verses 6 11, which Luke read earlier. So let's turn there. It says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
As is the case with all of us, our journey begins with being rescued. Our team, specifically the executive director, works with law enforcement, social workers, hospitals, and other rescue organizations to identify and rescue these young girls who have been victims of abuse and trafficking. The statement oversimplifies what is being done. As often as the case, these calls come um, not at convenient times. Um, Isaac, Doreen's husband, told me a story how in the beginning they got a call from the police station. Uh, it was in the middle of the night, so they said they would be there the first thing in the morning, which they were. Unfortunately, while this girl was at the police station, one of the officers took advantage of her. From that point on, Doreen and Isaac have determined that whatever and whenever it takes, they would go to rescue these girls when they get the call. We work with these other organizations as a safety measure. Um, we don't want to be accused of kidnapping or trafficking children in our attempt to rescue them. Once we rescue a girl, she is provided with safe shelter, medical care, food, clothing, and education. When we talk about rescue, I want you to think on that word. To us, rescue often means to be rescued from injury or in some rare cases from death. <clears throat> Imagine being in a situation where your God-given protectors are the ones inflicting harm on you. A harm seemingly worse than death and surely no way of escape. This, this is rescue. Looking at Romans 5.8, there's a phrase that every time I see it in the Bible, I'm reminded of how great our God is. This phrase is, but God. Think on this. Each of these young girls that have been rescued, they've been through unimaginable horror, but God rescued them. As much as we may not be, as much as we may not be able to fully understand this, there is a greater rescue. We were once in slavery to sin, but God rescued us. What is your but God movement? I think of Paul. He was on his way to rip families apart and imprison and kill Christians, but God met him on his way and changed his heart. Elijah wanted to die. He wanted to give up. He was tired of being hunted, but God found him, fed him a meal, and sent someone to walk with him. David, according to Jewish law, committed unforgivable sins, but God, uh, God forgave him and restored him. Peter had given up. He gathered other disciples with him and went out fishing, which they failed at that night, but God met him on the beach that morning and restored him, and he became a pillar of early Christianity. I have two challenges for you today. One, remember your but God moment. And remember where you might have been had it not been for that moment. Secondly, God didn't end with that moment, but left you here. And I believe it's so that we, become, we can become a part of the gut, of the but God moment in someone else's life. I'm not naive enough to think that there wouldn't be someone here today that never received their rescue. You may be someone who so desperately wanted to be rescued, to be heard, to be free, and never received it. I want you to know that God has not forgotten you. I want to turn to one of my favorite narratives in the Bible, um, mostly because it helps us understand a little bit more of who God is. So Genesis 16. And it reads, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. 
I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me, she looked on me with contempt. <clears throat> May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abraham said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where, you've, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring, so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Laharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. Because Abram was the father of Israel and had faith in God and was a hero of our faith, I think we give him significant grace in this story. Maybe I'm reading too much through it through the lens of a modern reader, but human nature doesn't really change that much. So I don't think I'm being unfair. Hagar was a young woman who had been enslaved, used, abused, and ultimately mistreated very similarly to the way our girls at Lupin's have been treated. She finally escaped with nowhere to go but the desert, but God met her there and revealed two things about his nature to her. First, he told her to name her son Ishmael, the name meaning God hears. And then secondly, Hagar recognized that Yahweh is a God who sees, Jehovah Roy. You may not feel that God sees or hears you, but I assure you that he does. If you've never received your rescue, remember that he still is a God who sees and a God who hears, and he will rescue you. We're in Romans 5, but I didn't read verse 1. Uh, if we go back to read that now, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. It's pretty incredible. Earlier in our study through Psalms with Pastor Luke, we went through Psalms 5. If you want to turn there, I'm going to read verse 4 through 6. It says, for you are not a God who is pleased with, with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. While we were sinners, this is something we had to expect from God. His anger, his wrath, even by these verses, his hatred. However, that isn't the end. Because of what he has done, we can get to verse 7 of Psalms 5, which says, But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow towards your holy temple. What gives us this privilege that we can come into his house? It's because of the sacrifice that Jesus made that we can be saved from his wrath. In Romans 5.11, it says that we should rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ, who through him we have received reconciliation. We have received reconciliation through his forgiveness. Jesus, in one of his parables, talks about forgiveness, or rather about unforgiveness. Let's turn to Matthew 18. And I'm going to start at verse 21. Then Peter came up to him and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? 
Jesus said to him, I do not say that I do not say to you seven times, but seventy seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the, ser <clears throat> so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have, mercy, have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you? And in, ace, and in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father, father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. There's a lot to unpack in this parable. Um, but what I want to gather from this is that someone who has truly accepted God's forgiveness through Jesus, will and can forgive others. We know that holding on to unforgiveness affects us physically and emotionally and spiritually, and it affects our relationship with God. Someone who is reconciled with God through Jesus will also seek to forgive others. Another word for reconciliation is restoration. At Lupin's, as part of the girls' restoration, we teach them to forgive those who have wronged them, and I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that this is the most difficult for me. My flesh, even now as I'm going through this, fights me. These girls have every right to be angry and bitter, and it's not fair to ask them to forgive, but that's what God commands. Because he knows that's how we heal. What encourages me is that our girls are so very strong. <laughs> One of our girls asked if she could visit her abuser in jail to tell him that she forgives him. This is convicting to me because I've held on to unforgiveness for so much less. As our, Lupin, as our Lupin's girls have challenged me, I urge you to forgive others as our Father has forgiven us. It's not easy. It may not seem fair. But like our girls have challenged me, think of what they have forgiven and sometimes it makes it a bit easier. I think it's important to talk about forgiveness, though. I've seen Christians and churches fail hard at this. I think it's important to bring up. Sometimes we struggle to understand forgiveness from a biblical perspective. We sometimes see forgiveness as acting as if an offense never happened. I believe forgiveness means that I'm relinquishing my personal right for personal retribution. In the Old Testament, was God, when God was given the law, he provided a rule to lawgivers. Part of that was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What he was describing was just punishments for crimes, and he was giving that to lawgivers. However, in the New Testament, and even today, people take that commandment for personal vengeance. The law wasn't given to people individually but to the judges. So later in the New Testament, when Jesus is referencing this, he's not saying that the law is invalid. He's saying that your desire for personal retribution is invalid. Yes, I believe that God wants us to forgive, and I think he wants us to lay our right for personal retribution at his feet. But I also sincerely believe that he desires justice. There are some, sin, there are some sins where there are levels of authority higher than us that can still claim their retribution. And I would argue that they should. There are many sins that require us as Christians to seek out lawful retribution by the authorities, because if we're not, that person may hurt others as well. At Lupin's, we work with our girls to forgive, 
but we also work with the authorities and courts to bring justice. You may be here today and have endured what all Prince girls have endured. You may have been told that forgiveness means to forget and ignore what had happened to you. I want you to know that was unbiblical advice and goes against God's character as a just God. One of our core beliefs is that all suffering and hurt and pain that these precious ones have gone through would be meaningless if we don't also teach them about Jesus. They have gone through abuse and injustice, and rescuing them without teaching them of Jesus only rescues them from one form of slavery. At Lupin's, we recognize that the best thing that can happen in our girls' lives is to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. But they also need some practical lessons. We have counselors who help them learn to heal from their trauma. We have a pastor that visits and disciples them. They learn how to pray and the importance of studying God's word. We teach them the importance of physical activity and exercise. And one of the things that brings me great joy when I see them uh, is that they can play. They've had so much stolen from them, but to see them play shows me that some of their innocence has been restored. To hear their laughter and joy gives me comfort in knowing that they're safe and in a safe place. When they're ready, we send them to boarding school. This is a really big deal. Many of these girls' families can't afford the materials needed for the girls to go to school. While this isn't a hard and fast rule, the suffering these girls experience often happens in areas suffering from poverty. Providing them an education is a huge step in preventing abuse from happening to them in the future or their children or others in their family. Also, being at a boarding school removes them from the communities where they're at their risk of being abused again. I've heard someone say the phrase, why do bad things happen, is the wrong question because it implies bad things can't bring good. I don't want you to think that I'm saying that God intended these girls to go through this horror. What I'm saying is that focusing on that horror and the injustice doesn't help us grow. We need to focus on the fact that we are gods now and use the past to affect good in this world according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 is a verse that we all like. Um, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This verse is often misquoted or used out of context. However, for some, is it a great promise of God's sovereignty? Hardships and pain allow us to have our but God moments. I guarantee that many of, not all of us here today, have seen this verse made evident in our lives. Probably not always in the way we wanted or expected, but it has been made evident. Maybe that hardship, maybe that but God, allowed you to bring about good in someone else's life. This morning, I challenge you to think about this verse differently. Think of it this way. Am I willing to give myself so fully to God that I allow him to use me according to his purpose to bring about good? I can tell you that scares me. I'm not sure I'm willing to do that yet. I think of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, the things they endured to, uh, to bring about God's good. But that's our role as a Christian. Romans 12 is a great chapter in the Bible. In the beginning, Paul encourages us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God, which is our spiritual worship. He then goes through the rest of Romans 12, describing um, uh, how we offer ourselves, how we live as a Christian, how we live the Christian life to, to, um, to live out the first verse. But then he ends it with, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a phrase that I find poignant. Hurt people hurt people. I like this. It's helpful to understand that those who have gone through a lot. However, as Christians, I think we can turn that phrase around slightly to say, helped people help people. Our intent is to send our Lupin's girls to be the hands and feet of Christ 
to recognize when others are hurting like they were and to help them be rescued from their spiritual and physical slavery. In much the same way, after reconciling us with God and equipping us with the spirit of truth, Jesus sends us out. Matthew 28 recounts what we call the Great Commission. Jesus commands his followers to go make disciples of all nations and to teach them to observe all he has commanded. I don't think it's a stretch to say that Jesus spoke these words to you and I as well. We are his modern followers. We have been rescued, we have been restored, and we have been equipped through the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is sending us out into the world. If I can paraphrase the end of Romans 12, don't let the evil of this world or the evil that you have suffered or the evil that someone else is going through overcome you, but overcome that evil with good. It's easy to become overwhelmed with the hurt and need in this world, but don't let that stop you from doing good. This Mission Sunday is a reminder of this commandment. Yet many of us may not make it into all the world. However, we can still reach those people through missionaries. I understand that Lupins isn't a traditional missionary, but I can assure you that supporting the Lupins ministry is furthering the message of the cross. We at Lupins strive to be good stewards of the support God has given us, but unfortunately, funding is a limitation on how many girls we can rescue. We ask that you prayerfully consider joining us in this ministry and help us turn hurt people into helped people. And again, I, there is a newsletter, sign up in the back, grab a prayer card, and the report of our immediate needs. I'm going to pray, and then I'll have a short video for you. Father, thank you for everything that you've given us. Thank you for rescuing us and restoring us and healing us. I pray that we don't take that for granted, but recognize that you've called us to be your hands and feet to this world, to, um, to reach those that are also hurting. I also pray for our Lupins girls that you continue to heal them and help them recognize the great God that you are. Again, thank you for everything you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you click to the next one, please? Dear beloved, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am Nambia Doreen Gulova, the founder of Lupins Africa Rehabilitation Center. I am a wife and a mother of four lovely children. As we reflect on the power of the good news and its profound impact on the lives of children who are victims of abuse. At Lupins Africa, we witness firsthand the incredible journey through faith that these girls get healing and hope. The gospel teaches us about love, redemption, and the promise of new beginnings. Survivors at Lupins Africa, it is not just a principle, it is a lifeline. Through our programs, we empower them to reclaim their voice and equip them to become advocates of change in their communities. As the body of Christ, we are called to stand alongside these individuals through prayer, support, and resources. Together, we can help these individuals turn their pain into purpose, enabling them to share their stories and impact others. Let us continue spreading the good news, reminding all that healing is possible and that every life has the potential to make a difference. Your support and commitment is very vital to this mission. Through the love of Christ, we can be that difference. Stay blessed. Thank you, Michael, for sharing this morning um, and a reminder for us of the work that God is doing, the way that he is caring for these girls and how he's bringing about good um, in the midst of their lives. We praise God for that. And um, Now we come to a time when we encourage you to prepare your hearts, ask God to prepare your heart for a time of remembrance, remembering what he did in sending his son to Die on the cross for our sins so that we might have life. A reminder, as Michael shared this morning, of the great forgiveness we have received.
because of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and rising again from the grave. So we rejoice in that as we prepare for this time of communion. I'd invite you to sing with me a a very fitting hymn as we prepare, one that uh, many of us likely know quite well. Jesus loves the little children. We'll sing it through twice. Let's sing unto the Lord together. (laughs) 